Hello everyone and welcome back to Affinity for Commander. My name is Alex and today we're going to be looking at the lore behind one of the spookiest planes in all of existence, Innistrad. Should this lore inspire you to make your own spooky deck or include a few cards here and there, then be sure to check out all of our affiliate links in the description box below for any of these lovely places to browse your singles or buy in bulk. Doesn't cost you anything extra, and really helps the channel out a lot. Speaking of helping out the channel a lot, this episode, along with all other Affinity for Commander content, is made possible thanks to the support of our amazing patrons. You guys are truly awesome. Equally, if you want to spookify your deck further, then be sure to head over to altersleeves.com and peruse their extensive library of fantastic artwork. Again, going through the affiliate link in our description box below doesn't cost anything extra, but helps us out. Now, on to the law of Innistrad. Now, Innistrad has always been a place of grim, horror, werewolves, fluff, and blood. So, not really a place you want to take the kids for a holiday. And this might have something to do with the weird, metallic -y, silvery moon that hangs in the sky over Innistrad which has been known to turn people mad and turn others into werewolves. Leaving that moon aside for a few minutes, our story begins centuries ago with a young alchemist by the name of Edgar. You see, Edgar, as well as the rest of his family, had poor failing health, as many peasants in Innistrad did, so he was looking for a way to extend his life and help out his family. Kind of altruistic when you put it like that. The problem was, he then got entangled, as one tends to do, with the demons, and one particular demon, Shilingar, nudged Edgar ever so slightly, and him and his sons went on to capture the angel Marises, and then um, sort of drain her of all of her blood and torture her. Yeah, the altruism here is fading quickly. But it was, however, through these experiments and disgustingness, Edgar was able to transform himself from a simple alchemist's apprentice into Edgar Markov, the first vampire. Wishing to spread his newfound power and abilities throughout his family, Edgar went about turning each one of his bloodline into a vampire just like him. And this eventually wound its way down to his grandson, one by the name of Sorin. It was, however, upon Sorin being turned into a vampire that his planeswalker spark ignited and transported him far away from his family and Innistrad itself. Now, after joy hopping around the multiverse for a century or two, Sorin comes back to Innistrad to find his family has grown quite considerably as well as the fact that vampires and werewolves are sort of running amok all over the plain. You see, Sorin, now definitely in his daddy phase of unlife, had become wise enough to realise that without humans, vampires would eventually starve or resort to cannibalism. And so, to protect his race, Sorin goes about a two-part plan to keep balance in the plain of Innistrad. Step 1 carve a huge chunk off of the silver moon of the plane. Don't, don't ask me how, he just, he just does. And then use this piece of the silver moon to construct the Hell Vault, an impenetrable prison used to contain all the demons and horrors of the plane that couldn't be killed or gotten rid of by normal means. Step two, create an indestructible sentinel the people of the plane to rally around and help fight back and protect them when he is not there, which is most of the time. And thus Sorin created the Archangel Avacyn, a protector to champion the people, spreading faith and hope wherever she went. Following this, and feeling like he'd done a good day's worth of work, Sorin decides to peace out and go off to Zendikar with Nahiri and Ugin to imprison some Eldrazi. Now, with a symbol of hope on the plane, the people and humans of Innistrad rallied around Avacyn and her angels, 
and they were able to form the Church of Avacyn. Yeah, the naming committee was definitely out to lunch for that one. Through the church, however, now magic of faith and hope actually had physical properties on the plane. Yes, for the first time ever, hashtag thoughts and prayers actually did something. And this went on for some time. Avacyn and her angels, along with the churches and paladins, battling to keep the force of darkness away and return the plane to some form of balance. However, as any good biology teacher will tell you, nature abhors a vacuum. And so, with a lot of the monsters and werewolves beaten back, there was now a spot for something much worse to take its place. And that something was demons. Yes, demons began running amok much more and more all over Innistrad. And after slaying several of them, Avacyn discovered that no matter what, or how they were killed, they just kept reappearing in one form or another. And thus to stop this threat, Avacyn came up with a brilliant idea of trapping them in the Hell Vault, and is also where you actually get that lovely recognisable symbol from Innistrad, because that symbol was meant to be a collar to go around the demon's neck and push them into the Hell Vault. Which, I don't know about you, but that sounds, like, super painful. And it was at this point that balance was now properly restored on the plane. Yes, werewolves still ate small children and monsters still lurked in the lakes, but it now was pretty even. And just like any good manager, Sorin turned up straight away, looked around, saw the work that Avacyn and her church had done, and took full credit for it. However... It was whilst now deciding to stay on Innistrad for a bit, now that it was fine to do so, Soren missed a very important call from his best friend, former student, and longtime karaoke buddy, Nahiri. You see, while Soren was off with Nahiri and Ugin over on Zendikar, they were imprisoning the Aldrazi, Ulamog, Kozilek, and Emrakul. And they did a pretty good job of it. And so, after their imprisonments, Ugin, Sorin, and Nahiri made a double super secret pinky swear promise that if anything bad were to ever happen, Nahiri, who was going to stay on her home plane of Zendikar, was to simply call out and Sorin and Ugin would turn right back up to help sort things out. And well, as you can obviously predict if you've played Magic in the past two years, things did go wrong and the Eldrazi Titans did break out. Emrakul buggered off immediately, having enough of this plane and its BS. Ulamog and Kozlek, however, being a lot more of a revenge-minded type titan, decide to stay around and see the plane off into the sweet black night. Nihiri, obviously being desperate for some manner of help, called out to her former mentor and a spirit dragon. And what did she get? Yeah, no one picked up. Ugin had the best excuse, considering he was a bit busy being dead over on Tarkia. And so, after being able to barely keep the Aldrazi Titans at bay all by herself with the help of the plane, Nahiri pops over to Innistrad to politely ask Sorin, WTF man? Sorin then calmly explains to Nahiri that her message must have got trapped by the immense power put out by the Hell Vault. Nahiri, however, did not buy this completely logical and true explanation for why Sorin didn't turn up, and thus decides to threaten Sorin with violence and draw her sword. Avacyn, meanwhile, saw this and went, threat to the plane, my job is to protect the plane, attack Nahiri. And so, that kind of happened. The two had a very brief sparring battle, at which point Sorin decided to intervene and conclude the best thing to do was to put Nahiri in a timeout by imprisoning her in the Hell Vault. Sorry, you can't solve all your problems by imprisoning them in the Hell Vault. With this, Sorin returns to his mind to continue spilling blood out of a goblet, and Avacyn goes back to her regular day job of fighting demons. Speaking of which, one of them actually gives her a bit more than she bargained for. During one of her routine patrols, 
Allison comes across one particular demon that has decided to fly over and simply land and sit on the Hell Vault and started egging Allison on for a fight. And that demon was no other than Grizzlebrand himself. Now, I don't know about you, but I imagine sitting on top of the Hell Vault would be very uncomfortable with those massive balls he must have to do this. And so the angel and demon have an all-out battle around the prison, which lasts for literally days. Do you know how angry you have to be to fight for literally days on end? However, with the fight coming to a close, Avison was in fact able to collar Grizzlebrand and push him into the Hell Vault, imprisoning the demon. However, Grizzlebrand is nothing if not a sore loser. So, as he was being dragged into the Hell Vault through Avison's magic, he reaches out with his hook and grabs Avison and pulls her in along with him, trapping both the demon and the angel alike. Thankfully, it was more of an ethereal plane where people in there and the demons couldn't actually harm each other. It was more just through mean words and looks. On the plane, however, the people were now without a protector, and the church kind of really wanted to keep it hush-hush that Avison had gone missing. I mean, the only real way to get her out of there would be to break the Hell Vault open, but that would release all the demons and werewolves and monsters that were already imprisoned in there along with Nahiri, who is less than happy. I mean, come on, no one is going to be that ruinous and self-absorbed to actually go and destroy the Hell Vault, releasing untold havoc on the plane. Surely no one is going to be that silly. No one's going to be that self-absorbed. Whilst all of this is going on, Liliana, another planeswalker, having made some pacts with some demons for her power, youth, and cool full-body tattoos, decides that instead of living up to her contract, she'd rather just kill the contractors. But it's cool, because they're demons. And whilst yes, this might sound like running away from one's problems, that's kind of her defining character trait. And one of the demons that Liliana made a pact with was Grizzlebrand himself. So she rocks up to Innistrad, only to find that Grizzlebrand was a wee bit imprisoned. And so, without a second thought, Nahiri breaks open the Hell Vault and releases all the demons, werewolves, and horrors back into the plane. This also releases Grizzlebrand for Liliana to go off and fight, Nahiri, who is now super angry, as well as Avacyn. Concentrating on Grizzlebrand for just a moment, the demon flies away, only to be tracked down by Liliana and subsequently killed. <laughs> Liliana gets a scratcher name off her to-do list and then actually decides to stay on Innistrad. You know, she likes the goth aesthetic and all that. Avison, meanwhile, now free, runs around the plane trying very hard to clean up the mess that was made in her absence. Nahiri, however, now free, took some time and decided the most logical thing to do. So she went back to Zendikar and opened up a little cafe where with every purchase of a hot drink, you get a cute little lithomancer made miniature of your favorite animal. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. She decided to destroy an Estrad. Now simply bubbling with rage and wanting nothing more than revenge on Sorin, for, in her mind, completely dooming her own plane and then locking her in a hell vault, she decides to go around and get some good old-fashioned poetic justice. After all, the Eldrazi were destroying her plane, so she decided to get the Eldrazi to destroy Innistrad. To do this, Nahiri went around setting up cryptoliths all over the plane. These were stone works that would accumulate and enrich the manor of the plane itself, thus making it seem a lot more manor rich than it actually was, mainly to entice the Eldrazi to come to Innistrad. And with this new tentacled threat looming, Eldrazi's influence began having an effect on the people of the plane. They began becoming twisted versions of themselves. Even the angels of the plane that were there to protect the people were now becoming deformed monstrosities, ripped straight from H.P. Lovecraft's greatest, most uncopyrightable dreams. 
Whilst all this was going on, Nahir decided that she was going to pay a visit to Markov Manor, and upon arrival decided the place really needed some new decor. This, however, had not all gone unnoticed. Soren began actively going around the plane, searching for the cause of the disturbance. Why on earth had the people began to turn into monstrosities themselves? Why were the angels turning mad? And now, why his beloved sentinel Avacyn herself began turning on the humans that she was made to protect? Yes, even Avacyn herself had gone from pure and kind-hearted to now deranged and mad, seeing impurity and scorn wherever she went, randomly killing individuals and burning towns to the ground. After a brief conversation with Tamio, a fellow planeswalker that had been researching the effects happening on Innistrad, and Jace, who had followed the Aldrazi's footprints all the way here, Soren decided there was only one thing to do for his beloved Sentinel. Soren had created Avacyn, so it was a cruelty beyond imagining, a pain beyond description, that it fell upon him to end her forever. Following this, Soren returns to his manor, probably to try and collect his thoughts and maybe calm down a bit, only to find Nahiri already there, and... Well, it wasn't a good sight, let's put it that way. Soren returned home to find Nahiri had fused all of his bloodline into the walls of his manor, killing them. Venturing further in, Soren found Nahiri just tearing parts from his home and restructuring it as she saw fit. Now, this, understandably, threw Soren into a little bit of a rage and attacked Nahiri point blank. The two had an all-out fight, essentially destroying what was left of Markov Manor, and Nahiri, through the tiniest of fractions, was able to pull off a victory by sealing Sorin in a wall along with his kin. Which, for those not paying attention, missing a phone call, murdering a plane. Not really the same thing. And now, without obstacles in her way, Nahiri continued to set up cryptoliths all around the plane and was finally able to entice and pull one of the Eldrazi Titans through into Innistrad. And it was at this point that Nahiri decided to get the hell out of Dodge, because the Titan that appeared was none other than Emrakul herself, the biggest and baddest of the Eldrazi Titans here to corrupt your people and eat your mana. And she was all out of people. Now with the plane's protector unmade, Sorin stuck in a wall, and the various angels of the plane transformed into grotesque horrors, it was really only thanks to the intervention of the Gatewatch that Innistrad even survived. The Gatewatch themselves were a group of planeswalkers dedicated to the protection of the multiverse from whatever colossal threat was spreading across the planes. And Emrakul definitely classifies as a colossal threat. The Gatewatch, along with the help of Liliana and Tamio, battled throughout Innistrad, pushing back the messed up cult of Lovecraft enthusiasts and deformed angels, until they came face to face with Emrakul herself. Now, the battle between the Gatewatch and Emrakul can best be summed up with the phrase, I am out of your league. Which she definitely was. So, instead of fighting the flying spaghetti monster, Tamio had a brilliant idea. Soren had used a piece of Innistrad's Silver Moon to create the Hell Vault. Don't, don't ask me how. So, surely, the rest of the moon would make a fantastic prison for Emrakul herself. With the help of several other planeswalkers, Tamiya was in fact able to seal Emrakul away in Innistrad's Silver Moon. The Aldrazi's influence began to subside in the plane, and people returned to normal. Werewolves went back to doing werewolf things, vampires went back to cultivating humans as cattle, but mainly everything went back to normal. Now, yes, without Avacyn around, there was a bit of an issue on the fact that the humans were a bit outmatched. 
but there were still several angels around to keep the faith and help humanity along the way. And heck, there were even some non-humans that identified that having a balance between the races was a relatively good thing for everyone. So, all's well that ends well as far as I'm concerned. Emrakul's trapped, the people aren't tentacled horrors anymore. Yeah, it'll be fine. After all, it's, it's not like imprisoning an Eldrazi Titan in a moon on a plane where there's werewolves will ever have any negative impact, right? Right? <laughs>